talk you through um, a fellow's soliloquy. In my copy, it's lines 260 um, to 280. Um, what I want you to do is just make notes as, as we go through it um, together. I'll read it once straight through for you first, um, and then we'll talk through it, I think, sentence by sentence. This fellow's of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, though that her jesses were my dear heartstrings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Haply, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have, or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not so mu not much. She's gone, I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapour of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing that I love for others' uses. Yet tis the plague to great ones, prerogative, that they are less than the base. Tis destiny unshunnable like death. Even then this forked play is fated to us when we do quicken. Look where she comes. Okay, um, so before we get stuck into it, I just um, want you to note the difference between um, Othello's soliloquy um, here and Iago. So, you know, Iago on stage, kind of full of confidence, full of cunning. We have that very kind of engaging, um, almost interaction uh, with the audience through his uh, rhetorical questions. We get quite a different um, Othello on stage. You know, he's kind of troubled. He is almost turned in on himself, contemplating. He's kind of, you know, raking over these problems, you know, doubting himself, questioning who he is, questioning, um, you know, Desdemona, who he loves and adores. He is becoming undone um, before our very eyes. So let's take that first sentence then. This fellow, so obviously Iago, this fellow's of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. So this is a real kind of compliment then to Iago's intelligence and common sense. Um, here, um, Othello sort of assuring himself, reassuring himself that he is taking advice from the right um, person. That he's really kind of, you know, it's good to kind of trust Iago because he knows so much. And we see that in the um, word choice and the diction exceeding um, to describe his honesty. And that all, when he talks about how much he knows um, of all qualities um, of human dealings. So you can kind of link that to, um, you know, here, um, Othello thinks that Iago really knows the ways of Venetian, uh, the Venetian world better than he does. And that's sort of, uh, you know, part of his justification um, for um, trusting him. Um, I guess Iago does really have a sort of all-knowing air about him um, when human um, behaviour is concerned. And, you know, maybe to some extent, um, you know, he does, um, you know, he does know and see and understand people really well. I mean, he's certainly able to, ex you know, yeah exploit every kind of single little aspect of different people's um, characters. Um, so yeah, he, he's able to use um, that sort of uh, psychologist uh, aspect of himself um, to his advantage um, throughout. To the next line then we get this metaphor. If I do prove her haggard, though that her jesses were my dear heartstrings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. I've just noticed here, um, actually, let us, uh, oops, hang on, there we go, wanted to get my red, there we go, uh, just at this, in my copy, actually, I've copy and pasted this one, uh, but it's an E, so pray. So this is a um, metaphor uh, then using that kind of animal um, imagery um, again. Um, 
haggard um, here, which means a kind of female um, falcon. So this metaphor is really telling us, you know, the consequence that Desdemona will face if Othello can prove that she has been unfaithful. Uh, he's really kind of, um, so after sort of reassuring himself in that kind of calm way, yes, Iago is the one I should uh, trust. Here he's kind of venting a bit of um, pent up um, rage. So Female falcons then are known to be unruly, um, and so in the kind of personification of this haggard, of this falcon, when it's kind of referring to a woman, um, it means that she's, you know, unchaste, unfaithful. Okay, um, and so in here, and that idea of her, um, the, her dresses, so, you know, basically saying, though she's kind of tied to, um, you know, her claws are tied to my heartstrings. So kind of imagine that image of, you know, a falcon on a rope flying around um, its master. So, you know, though she's kind of tugging away, pulling, you know, pulling to uh, be released. If she proves kind of false, if she proves that, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to, you know, I, I'd turn her out, um, basically. Um, you can see uh, in this sentence we've got her repeated four times, her haggard, her dresses, her off, let her down the wind. I suppose the repetition of that just um, shows how kind of preoccupied and all consumed he now is um, by this idea of Desdemona being unfaithful. Okay. Um, so I suppose we're saying that, you know, she's like this kind of wretched bird who is leashed, tied to him um, through marriage. Um, but she will be set off to fend for herself, kind of turned um, out to fortune um, if, uh, if he were to prove she had been unfaithful. Okay. Um, and, you know... I'm always wary of alliteration, but I suppose you could um, kind of look here. We've got the her haggard um, there, and then we've got the though that uh, here. Um, and I think that I suppose this like series of repetitions, and if you sort of look at the punctuation um, within the line as well, it's almost um, reflecting what's happening in the sentence. So in within this sentence, we've got this idea of this kind of unruly falcon tugging at the leash trying to get away I suppose that could be you could say that that has been reinforced by the punctuation or and also reinforced by the alliteration as I always say make sure your alliteration is kind of a secondary supporting point further evidence to an existing idea rather than anything standalone okay um, next then we see him um internalizing criticism of others um, so let's read it first haply for i am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have or for i am declined into the veil of years yet yeah, that's not so much she is gone i am abused and my relief must be to loathe her okay um so hang on let's find I've put my um, notes here. Okay. So here he's kind of questioning, really questioning his um, identity. I think that, uh, you know, we see the effects of Iago's brainwashing um, here. He's, you know, he's basically kind of like, oh, he's ruining the fact that he's black. You know, remember that um, all the time, he is othered in the play, you know, by everyone else. This issue of race is used as an identifying um, feature. It's used to kind of criticise him in any sphere um, other than the military one. Now he seems to um, be like, oh, well, you know, I am black. Um, you know, I am other. I am from somewhere else. I don't speak in the way that um, Venetians um, speak, you know, those, that idea of those soft parts of conversations. And then he's saying, well, you know, maybe I'm old. I'm declined into the veil of years. But then, you know, and here, this kind of punctuation, uh, it's almost kind of like the, the back and forth in his own mind. It's kind of 
conversation with himself, you know, well, you know, maybe it's because I'm black, maybe it's because I don't speak in the proper way, or, you know, maybe it's because I'm old, but, but I'm not that old. And then he's kind of, she's gone and I'm abused. And he's kind of like, okay, well, you know, whatever the reason, there she goes. This is uh, the situation and all that's left. My only kind of recourse now is to loathe her, to hate her. Um, okay. Um, and I just kind of link here to, you know, hopefully you read it and really underline this part yourself. But if you go back a couple of, my just a couple of pages back, when um, Yago was kind of mid persuasion, he was saying, um, I, there's the point, as to be bold with you, not to affect many proposed matches of her own clime, complexion and degree, whereto we see in all things nature tends. Foe, one may smell in such a will most rank, foul disproportion, thoughts unnatural. So, you know, Yago before, he, it's at first he'd appeared kind of totally unwilling to say anything at all against um, Cassio and, and Desdemona. And then kind of, you know, when this is supposedly pushed or having engineered uh, Othello to kind of push him and ask him for the truth, he's like, OK, we well, you know, yeah, now you mention it. If I'm being forthright, I suppose it is a bit unnatural um, for Desdemona to have turned down so many good men of her own race and her own class and sophisticated good men in order to go out with you. Yeah, that is unnatural. And so that's kind of got to him here, isn't it? Hasn't it? We can see that in these references there. O oh, curse of marriage, is this an apostrophe? So this is where you sort of address um, a concept or an idea or a, an inanimate um, object. O oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. Um, so he's kind of referring, um, he's sort of talking here um, about marriage. Um, so just when he seems to be kind of um, right, that's it. All that's left is for me to hate her. He's resolved in loathing Desdemona. His love for her and his conflicting emotions and confusion seem to kind of fuel this um, this cry here. Um, and we see here a bit of the conflict between Iago's influence and his own natural tendencies to refer to his wife as a um, delicate creature. Okay, so this, oops, hang on, what have I done? Uh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, so this is his language, isn't it? This delicate creature, that's very much how he would refer to Desdemona. And this idea of their appetites, referring to their kind of you know, sexual appetite, this is very much the kind of um, base vulgarity, the language that kind of is coming from Iago. So again, it's kind of, we're seeing how Iago has infiltrated um, Othello's thinking here. Okay, uh, then we move on to this. Oh, I'd rather be a toad and live upon the vapour of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing that I love for others' uses. Okay, this is almost kind of quite childlike, this little, um, you know, analogy um, here. Um, and it seems to be quite kind of full of, yeah, so I'm saying kind of full of self-pity, um, really. Um, and I think, um, you know, that, that lack of um, punctuation makes it all the more kind of childlike. And, and this, the, you know, a corner in the thing I love, um, well, there he's kind of distancing, he, you know, Desdemona is the thing, the person, the woman that he loves, but this slightly kind of distancing himself um, from her, you know, kind of unlucky to love this thing you know maybe arguably misogynistic to refer to her um, as a thing um, and then he says yet tis the plague to great ones Pro progative are they less than the base tis destiny unshunnable like death okay so here he's saying um He's kind of probably trying to comfort himself a bit because he's saying, you know, I guess this is the trade of 
the trade-off of being a, a great man. It is the plague of great ones um, that, you know, I guess, you know, men that aren't great wouldn't have to worry um, about losing um, their women. OK, it's just the trade off, this loss of fidelity um, and, you know, inherent in the um, sort of great ranks, um, really. OK, and that is tis destiny, uh, unshunnable like death. It's quite defeatist um, here. Um, you know, it's quite kind of cynical, really. It seems like he's beginning to kind of feed his own um, depression now and to communicate the gravity of his current state of mind. Um, you know, he's accepting his own um, powerlessness, isn't he? Um, Tis destiny unshunnable like death. You know, this is unavoidable. This is kind of what, you know, what becomes of us. This is not really what you'd expect. This is not the voice of the man that has led the Venetian army. Um, you know, that's not the kind of attitude that you have, is it? Um, in that context, I suppose he would, you know, it's, you know impossible to defeat. Um, he is strong. He is brave. He is valiant. This kind of defeatist giving up kind of wouldn't really, um, you know, occur to him. And now this idea that he's just kind of, you know, a pawn in destiny. He has no control. He has no autonomy. He has no power over his own um, fate. Even then, this forked plague is fated to us when we do quicken. So this kind of, um, this means really here that uh, it, when you're born, so when we do um, quicken, that jealousy, this forked plague. So it's quite kind of violent imagery here, you know, thinking of this as a kind of sexual thing. This forked plague is fated to us when we um, do quicken. So we are really sort of doomed here. Jealousy, like dying, just kind of can't be avoided. It's destined to us um, at, um, at birth. And then he says, oh, look, here she comes. So we can see then, just to summarise, He's completely um, undone here. You know, he establishes at the beginning this kind of complete faith um, in Iago. This, um, you know, suspicion born um, now, you know, it, it exists. He's doubting Desdemona. He's doubting himself. And then it's kind of, you know, a dumb, a dumb thing. You know, he's cursing the um, very idea of being married and the very kind of condition of it. And, you know, what is left for us um, but to kind of hate, to loathe and to, you know, this is like death and this is unavoidable like death. OK, so he's in a bit of a state. So obviously here he's not really in the mood for her to come again once again pleading Cassio's case, wheedling away. 